The Unshackled Waves, Episode 78. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back for another interview show, and we are lucky to have as our guest today law academic Dr. Augusto Zimmerman. He is a director of postgraduate research at Murdoch University, which is in Western Australia. He's also the president of the Western Australian Legal Theory Association. He's also a commissioner with the Law Reform Commission of Western Australia. He was a candidate to be the next president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Uh, he was the clear standout candidate for those who wanted to see the the Human Rights Commission focus on real freedoms and human rights, such as free speech. Unfortunately, the Turnbull government went with the safe option and appointed uh, Rosalind Croucher as the new Human Rights Commission president. He's also also co-author of the book No Offence Intended, Why 18C is Wrong, uh, which is published by our friends at Conoquot Publishing. Uh, The book sets out a constitutional and philosophical case about why uh, 18C is wrong. So I uh, thought I'd invite Dr Zimmerman on to discuss the Australian Human Rights Commission and human rights more generally in Australia. So Dr Zimmerman, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you very much, Dean. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be having this conversation with you. Now, I thought I'd begin by asking uh, to, for you to give an overview of your academic work. I mean, what areas of law and human rights do, does your research focus on? Well, it's mainly human rights and certainly the rule of law, the concept of the rule of law that I believe to be under threat here in, in Australia. And uh, it's basically a work on human rights in general. And I have a special uh, focus now on freedom of speech, as you know, and also a little bit about uh, freedom of religion, especially in the context of the idea of church and state separation. So that's basically my work. Of course, I have written a couple of articles, books, and you name it. Uh, I was uh, even uh, to the point of earning the Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research because of my academic production. So I just try to, you know, be engaged and to produce articles that are mainly uh, related to these areas of freedom of speech, um, rule of law, individual rights in general. Uh, I'm very much connected with these issues. And another thing that I really like is to analyze the existence of laws uh, from a philosophical perspective, because all laws have somehow a philosophical underpinning. And so my role is also, uh, uh, in many ways, a a, a role of legal theorist. I actually teach legal theory, and even uh, I'm a president of a legal theory association, and we edited one, uh, we are editing a law journal that's focused on legal theory issues here from Murdoch University. It's called the Western Australian Jurist. Yeah, it's, it's certainly good to, to have somebody like you in, in academia. We often hear about the, uh, the biases of the uh, universities, but it's always refreshing to uh, see work published by people such as yourself. Now, 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, it's the most talked about uh, anti-free speech law that we have in Australia. But uh, I, I sometimes feel that uh, other uh, anti-free speech laws uh, don't gain as much prominence as they should. should. So mm-hmm. can you uh, talk about some of the other threats to freedom of speech in Australia? Well, we have plenty of those, uh, unfortunately. Uh, even to the point that when it comes to areas that are unexpected, uh, for instance, um, uh, the government has released uh, recently, the federal government, a uh, pamphlet, uh, basically a booklet or something of this nature, saying that um, verbal abuse can be considered uh, grounds for domestic violence order. So if you say something that is inconvenient, now in the kitchen, because uh, the, the, the funny thing is that uh, the commissioner, the president of the Australian uh, Human Rights Commission said that what you say in the kitchen should be 
uh, watched over and, and you could be punished for that. That was her um, desire. But desire is already fulfilled because not even in the kitchen you say think, can say things without getting into trouble and that you can lose your property rights as a result. And that's because the concept of uh, violence has been extended to verbal interactions as well. And so it's really crazy. And uh, in Victoria, you live in the Socialist Republic of Victoria, as, a, as I know. Yeah. They have yeah, they have in the Socialist Republic of Victoria a uh, religious uh, vilification law that is actually used by um, uh, radicals as an instrument of punishment um, to those who question the religious uh, fanatical positions. It's, uh, it's being used as a form of blasphemy law by stealth. And I have some cases uh, coming from uh, this law that are pretty appalling. So this uh, it's a dangerous move, and the Labour Party promises that if they get elected, they are going to introduce blasphemy law by stealth at federal level as well. And um, of course, our Attorney General seems to be unaware of what the law actually stands for, because when he was pushing for the change in the legislation, he said that this was to allow people to be bigots. I'm not so sure whether he wants to be a bigot, but the law has nothing to do with bigotry. The law has to do with people feeling offended. And my understanding, as I have tried to explain in my articles, is that the more you are a bigot, the more you feel offended. So the law is actually an invitation for intolerant people to be using this kind of uh, instrument to be silencing those who they have to happen to disagree with. So it completely backfires and is actually used as an instrument of intolerance rather than reducing tolerance. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been aware of the, as it's called, the Racial and Religious uh, Tolerance Act for a number of years. And uh, yes, I know of uh, probably the most famous example is uh, Danny Nalia, who's a pastor here, being prosecuted under that law. There, there's also, um, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, another section of the law. I did, I wrote an article on it uh, last year, I believe, off the top of my head. It's section 47417 of the uh, Criminal Code, which makes mm. it illegal to offend somebody uh, on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that should also be reformed as well? Well, certainly, I think uh, t t one of the things that I find it uh, problematic is the fact that we are supposed to live in a democracy. And the parliamentarians, they feel that they can say and do whatever they want. They can become quite nasty uh, in the uh, interactions in parliament, and they can be quite rude to each other. But they are actually not our bosses. They are actually our employees. I mean, we, if you live in a democracy, the sovereignty belongs to people like you and me, to, to the electors. And, so what's happening with this kind of approach is that they feel that they are superior to us. Some of these laws actually come with this whole idea about um, special ca ca categories of people who are actually protected from the uh, reach of the legislation. So for instance, if you happen to be an enlightened one like myself, I might have some protection for being an academic. I can say certain things that the normal mortal man cannot. And I think this is really a very stupid and dangerous thing. I contend that if we have a problem one day with problems like ra racism and, and stupid statements, that you come and to become influential, that you actually be coming from academics like myself, because there are plenty of idiots around in academia these days, and they say appalling things, but they seem to be more protected by this law on the grounds of the exceptions for academic purposes or something like that. But if you get drunk in a pub and you are just like a normal person and you say something really silly, then you can actually have your life completely undermined because some uh, person can use that for their own advantage. There is a financial gain in uh, using this kind of approach because you can actually go and blackmail another person. You can actually say, look, if you give me $10,000 or so, 
I'm going to stop this complaint and then you're going to, you know, uh, make my bank account a little bit fatter, but you're not going to have a lawyer or something like that. So it can be used as an instrument of um, uh, blackmailing. And certainly there is the chilling effect behind as well. So once you start to know that some people on the grounds of fighting against racism got into trouble with a law who pretends to be about uh, uh, n preventing racism and it goes the other way around, then you start to really be very afraid about what you might say. Think about those key UT students, that's what I'm talking about. One of them was actually saying that QUT was um, uh, introducing pol policies and adopting policies that uh, uh, prevented him because of the color of his skin on, the, on these grounds to attend a lab. And he was accused of being racist on these grounds. I mean, so now the person who fights against racism is being uh, accused of racism under this uh, legislation that can be used for these purposes and then have the, this whole problem that we know. Yeah, I mean, uh, m most most of the time, if you say something that you know people are offended by or deem politically incorrect, that that'll that'll just be the end of it. But yeah, it, 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 these sort of things, as you mentioned, you know, blackmail being dragged before these commissions, it can happen. Most of the time, it doesn't happen, but it's a possibility. And like what happened to those uh, QUT students, it can potentially uh, ruin your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. I mean, it, uh, if you're not uh, backed up by a, a big organization, if you're just a normal citizen, you will be spending your whole um, money, perhaps even a hundred thousand dollars. Lawyers are very expensive in Australia, don't forget it. And even if you, fa you are found to be completely innocent, who's going to pay for the emotional stress? And all the money they had to spend with lawyers and the legal legal process. I mean, it's um it's the chilling effect that's one of the main problems, I guess. Make a point here. Many people think that Australia has more of the rule of law than many countries, but you know, access to justice in this country is just for the privileged people. If you have if you are rich, you can have a lawyer. If you're very poor, you might get that crappy legal aid, but apart from that, you are screwed. Yeah, that's a, that's an important uh, observation to make, and uh, so, so you do think Australia is worse in this regard, access to justice? I think 90% of the population has difficulty to uh, get access to justice here. Uh, probably another uh, pr yeah. uh, greater problem we face in Australia. Yes, uh, undoubtedly. Now, obviously, free speech uh, seems to be the, the human right that conservatives and libertarians are focusing on uh, the most, but uh, what are some of the other important uh, human rights that you think we are lacking? Well, I think it's uh, because somehow these end up becoming one of my issues. Uh, as a lot of them commissioner um, uh, that I served for five years, we were uh, in charge of um, producing that report on domestic violence restraining orders. And I got appalled by the fact that uh, there are so many victims of the system because they were accused, falsely accused by uh, spouses who basically wanted to get rid of them. And these people can go to the police now and say, look, my husband did something, could be even verbal, could be financial abuse, banking, you name it. Like they have extended this, all sorts of things. Do you know what's the implication of this? A person loses everything. He's prevented from returning home. He's actually, he will get to know that he's now losing everything by the police. When the police is waiting for his return, when he comes back home, the, the guy will be there saying, you cannot enter in your own property. You cannot see your kids anymore because the person accused you of this or that. It, it doesn't really matter. It could be all sorts of things, as I say. The person loses everything. And I have uh, uh, collected many letters and I suspect thousands of people have lost everything they had in their lives. Uh, property, 
taxes to the kids, even bank accounts being assaulted because a person can be planning this kind of action for years in advance. So when the guy receives uh, an order, he has zero in his bank account. Perhaps his credit card has been exploded. Um, he's now facing accusations that can be quite outrageous and he has no money, no emotional condition to defend himself. He might even be homeless. All this supported by the system. All this supported by these terrible laws that are in place that were created um, at uh, perhaps uh, support of the feminist lobby. Wow, that's that, that's pretty amazing to hear it that is. there are you know, things like that uh, that could happen. I mean, it certainly yeah. doesn't get uh, mainstream media coverage. I doubt the ABC would make a documentary about that. <laughs> now, unless it happens with someone over there. I think it's easy to be just ignoring this issue, but you know, and uh, but I know as to be a to be a matter of fact that many people have basically lost everything, and they are innocent. They, they, then the, the courts prove their innocence, but it's too late. And no consequences for those who made these accusations. And do you definitely think, uh, because obviously there is, uh, as it's shown, this sort of hysteria about, you know, domestic violence in Australia, we hear the, the statistics, you know, one woman dies every week because of uh, yeah. pa partner abuse. So uh, with, uh, well, especially my state government in Victoria, they had the Royal Commission into Family Violence and uh, gave a whole bunch of money out uh, during the, the previous state budget. So is it an area of law which is getting worse in your view? Well, look, I don't, I'm not so sure whether there is a so-called epidemic of domestic violence. There is domestic violence going on, but we need to know the truth of the matter. I think you cannot do what is being done, that is the undermining of natural justice and due process of law. As a law reform commissioner, we released a report saying we need to know what's really happening. Because the person who makes the accusation might actually be the, the real abuser, because I think to make such an accusation that is actually unsubstantiated or false is, in my opinion, should be a for, or considered a form of domestic violence. And so I told the Attorney General that we need to know the truth. That's why you need the rules of evidence. But you know what they did in Western Australia? They have repealed the rules of evidence. There's no need for evidence to be provided, even when it comes to the final hearing. And the, the Attorney General, the, the previous Attorney General, completely ignored the recommendations of my commission. So we have a law reform commission writing to the, to the guy that he should never repeal the Magna Carta. They should never ignore natural justice or due process of law. And it has all these things have been completely ignored. So we do need, these people do not need to prove, even when it comes to the final hearing. So a person just says something and that's taken for granted. And then the other person loses everything. Yeah, that, that's certainly a conversation that, that we're not having when it comes to you know, uh, talk, talking about this issue. So yeah, when you put it in, you know, standard legal terms like that, we should really uh, step back and say, well, what are we doing to, you know, well-established legal principles? Yes. Yeah, of course, like, you know, and children will be affected as well because they uh, then prevented from seeing one of the parents. There is a link between this alienation and the payment of child support, by the way, because the child support scheme uh, when when the, the uh, non-custodial parent has to pay the custodial parent, that's proportional to the time of visitation. So these false accusations are very good because then if you make an accusation of this nature, the other person needing to provide, prove his innocence, he's paying 100% of child support. And then the magistrates attempt to keep the custody with the false accuser, even when the accusation is proven to be false, because they claim that the kid or the child got used to live with the other parent. Of course, because the other one was not was basically prevented from from seeing the, other, the his his or her own kid. So it's actually a reward and an incentive, financially speaking, to these. Uh, false accusations. A whole industry is taking place. About 80% of the restraining orders are proven to be entirely false at, when it comes to the to the final hearing, including people like who is being evicted from the properties 
because the wife has accused the uh, the wife was having an affair, was having a lover. The husband went just to have a talk to her and said, "We shouldn't arrive drunk at two a.m. You should actually, you know, have a bit more of concern for your kids and me, myself." I think it's not a good idea for you to be uh, every day arriving 2 a.m. and completely drunk. Then she went to the Justice of the Peace, and the, the Justice of the Peace gave her a restraining order because the husband was asking too much about her affair. And this guy was evicted from his property, and now she is there with her lover. Well, that's... That, that's mind blowing. The the fact that you know that uh, that goes on and not exposed. I'm glad that you know you're you're passionate about bringing this to the public's attention because it certainly uh, de uh, deserves it. Yeah, well, certainly, like we, as you can see, it's not free speech. The only problem that we are facing. There are many human rights issues in me, and certainly we have real human rights here, not the fabricated ones. Because it seems that this government's concerned about fake human rights that are uh, privileges uh, that can be given to special categories of people, uh, because, for instance, they can be uh, seen to be uh, having faced uh, previous or past instances of discrimination. But I think that is becoming an old-fashioned idea to say that everybody should have the same rights, regardless of gender. Regardless of uh, religion, we should all have same rights and be equal before the law. And I know this is actually like almost uh, uh, a novelty for many people. And I find it amazing that you have a liberal government that seems to care very little for the protection of, of individual rights. By the way, it seems that what they do is normally to attack individual rights. As I have said, they had this guideline extending the concept of domestic violence even to banking abuse. I'll tell you what it means. It means that if you do not share your bank account with your wife, you can be accused of domestic violence because she's going to say that she's being financially oppressed by you. And it's crazy. Because I can have reasons as to why I might not share a bank account. If my wife has a problem with alcohol or drugs or, or she's prodigal, I'm trying to help her by not sharing the bank account. It's obvious. Uh, so there might be reasons as to why we might not decide to do such a thing. But that can be considered a form of banking abuse, which is a form of now of domestic violence. Violence. And that was a guideline saying that if you criticize a person's looks, if you threaten divorce, that could also be domestic violence. And then you can get a person, another person get a restraining order against you. So that's another one of the things that I can see. And, and certainly like this refusal of the government to repeal Section 86 is a, another terrible sign that these people have lost the capacity to be concerned about protection of individual rights. Thank goodness, uh, Tony Abbott seems to have changed his mind, and I had the opportunity to have a conversation with him, and he apologized to me because he did the wrong thing. And that's the problem with the right. When they have the chance to do things, they get you know, too afraid of, 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 of um, disappointing the media. The media will never support them. So I think you have to do the right thing when you have the, have the opportunity. And of course, Tony Abbott missed that one. And certainly the current prime minister is not even a conservative, he's not even a liberal, and he's not advancing the, the causes of liberty here, unfortunately. Well, at least uh, uh, Turnbull eventually did uh, propose some reform to, to 18C, which obviously mm -hmm. didn't get past the, the Senate, but at least there was that pressure yeah. built on him that he, he did allow that vote. Now, obviously, uh, I mentioned your book at the beginning, which you um, uh, co-authored with Lorraine Finlay and uh, Joshua Foster, uh, No Offence Intended by 18C is Wrong. The, uh, the main focus of that uh, book is talking about how 18C might not be uh, co uh, constitutional and it also uh, touches upon the philosophical 
arguments uh, against it. Um, why did you feel that this was um, a, a good uh, topic to explore in a book? Well, because our politicians mainly have seem to have no knowledge of our constitution. I must say that the Attorney General, for instance, should be uh, 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 approaching this issue from a constitutional law perspective. He is the Attorney General. He should know the law. First of all, he the only thing he says is that we have the right to be bigots. That's not a very good approach because I can't say that this law has nothing to do with that. So his lack of knowledge of the law is a major problem. Because of course the law is, a, is unconstitutional because it's about people feeling offended by people, others expressing their opinions, you know, and the opinion can be a very reasonable one, but if the other person feels offended, then he can use this as an instrument of punishment, of persecution against those who dare to express a different opinion. Uh, look, I don't see the passion. I mean, uh, you can even have a very mild reform that was not good at all, to be frank with you. Uh, what about keeping of offendedness and, and uh, insult? We should get rid of this whole lot. I think the only way to go is to repeal this session, section and to establish stronger, uh, a stronger or more powerful threshold that would be saying that, you know, if you threaten someone or if you really, you know, incite people to commit acts of violence, that this thing should be uh, punished. Not about people having an opinion. Even because the courts are not going to decide methods of truth, it has never been so. And certainly, like, when you have all these litigation processes going on, even those who are the real, real intolerant people, one, they can use the law to punish innocent people. And the other, even if the law is used against them, they can claim then that they are martyrs. I and mean, the Nazis did that. That they were persecuted by the law before they got into power. And that was, according to Dan, another reason as to why they could confirm that the Jewish somehow people were involved in this whole process of persecuting them. So that can reinforce the paranoia. That can reinforce their uh, racist or bigoted positions just by saying that the, the persecution is another confirmation that they are really the victims. So you're certainly in favour of a full repeal of the 18th C, no reform of it. Well, if the, do you know what? If the politicians who are our employees have the right to have their free speech, we are the sovereign people. And in a democracy, we need to have free speech. Look, these people think more like totalitarians, you know. This is a crime of conscience. That's what used to happen in the Soviet Union. So what is that that you are bringing about communist ideology to this country? This whole thing about preventing people from... Do you really think the government can, can be trusted to tell me what I have to say? It's a dangerous idea. So it can go further and further. And then one day we cannot say anything unless the elite allows you to do so. So, of course, the elite wants to control speech because they want to control power, but we need to rebel. I think what you need is a classical liber liberation, a classical liberal revolution in this country. Uh, maybe one day we'll, we'll get there soon. Now, obviously, the other big threat to uh, human rights is obviously the ironically titled Australian Human Rights Commission. Now, uh, mm -hmm. you put your name forward to be the next uh, president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, which uh, the government, they, they went with what most people thought was the safe option of Rosalind Croucher. Um, so why do you believe, like, uh, this government, they're, they're so afraid at shaking up government bodies such as the Human Rights Commission or the, the ABC for that matter. Well, look, I applied for the position that would be my financial liberation because the salary is $500,000 <laughs> and, and they, they gave to Professor Croucher. I think she is wealthy enough. She wouldn't need all this money. Uh, another thing, I find it's but it's just, just this absolutely immoral because um, she's probably getting earning more than the prime minister. And another thing is, um, is that um, it seems that she was heavily political, that uh, other person, the Triggs, Professor Triggs. 
I was even asked by Andrew Bolt if I could do a better job than Triggs when I was interviewed by him, and I told him that it, it wouldn't be hard. <laughs> you know, it would be quite easy. I think she did a very poor job, and, and you know, Croucher was a safe uh, ground position for the government. She's going to be very good to the Labour Party, as she can be very good to the coalition, because she's very so-called moderate. So-called moderate is the one that is sitting on the fence. So basically what Croucher is going to do is to be lovely, and the government to be so comfortable. But I don't think it should be the, the case, you know. I think we should have someone who is really fighting for the restoration of fundamental rights and freedoms in this country. And I don't think this is going to happen. And seven years, I mean, normally you don't give out that to a person when she is a, a person is appointed to such a position. I think uh, Brandis might love this woman, and they have be, might be good mates, because I haven't heard of such a long-term appointment in my whole life. Normally, when you give to uh, appoint someone to a commission, this is only for about two or three years, and then you can renew. That happened with me and my fellow commissions at the Law Reform Commission of Western Australia. I have never heard of someone earning now assurance that she's going to be seven years going on half a million dollars, half a million dollars a year. Well, I, I would love it, but uh, certainly because I support too much free speech, perhaps I'm too much a protector or a fighter for real human rights, I am not. Uh, I was not considered to the position. Because it's real human rights that I support, not the fabricated ones of the United Nations, for instance. It was interesting that uh, the Abbott government, when it first came to power, they did show signs they were prepared to take on institutions like this. They appointed um, Tim Wilson uh, to yeah. the Human Rights Commission, which uh, you know everyone on the left had a had a fit about. And we, yeah. uh, but since Turnbull's taken over, I mean, there's been Ed Santo, who I haven't heard boo from, so they seem to have re reverted back to you know we don't want to upset too many people. Yeah. Well, that's what the, um, the so-called conservatives in the Liberal Party do. I mean, they probably want to be nice to people who would never ever contemplate voting for them. Think about, for instance, like that uh, his popularity rate seems to be uh, higher of the prime minister than of the opposition leader. But that doesn't reflect in, in the in the you know in votes for the labor for the liberal party because people who tend to think that um, um, Tombo is doing a good job is because they are labor supporters but i don't think he's going doing a good job because of, there are a couple of things that are very important if you call yourself a liberal party you should be supporting more liberty and more freedom and that's not happening so I think that it's a, a terrible thing when you have a so-called right wing, I don't even like this word, but let's let's call it right wing, but not doing anything to limit the size of government, to limit government, to reduce taxes, and to restore basic rights and freedoms. Quite to the contrary, this, as I say, like this guideline that the Attorney General produced it's, it's undermining human rights. It's going to be undermining rights, not giving rights to anybody. And another thing is like, if you think that uh, their approach to free speech is very weak, it's not uh, good enough. And I don't see this, uh, what I feel is a lack of commitment to fight for classical liberal values. I think that's one of the main problem, problems here in Australia at this point. And uh, certainly we deserve better leadership. Well, let's uh, put forward that the government did have the, the courage to uh, appoint you president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Uh, what would you, what would be some of your first actions in the job? Well, we have, for instance, today's issue of same-sex marriage. Regardless of what is the, the outcome is, we have to consider this in the context of protecting all human rights. So, it's an interesting position. It's almost same. So, well, something that looks like that uh, reminds me at least the Republican referendum when you had the people being told you can vote for this thing 
but we do not know how the law is going to be uh, drafted. I, I would say that as an Australian Human Rights Commissioner, that before you, you uh, introduce such a referendum, people should have the right to know what kind of law is going to be uh, enacted, because otherwise you might change your mind. Certainly, I would re-establish the right of people to exercise a very democratic and basic principle. That is the principle of freedom of speech. And certainly in respect, not only of our various and traditions, democratic values and traditions, but I would say in respect of the constitution itself. Because what, what I have mentioned to you is that some of our members in parliament seem not to know that um, implied in our constitution, there is a freedom of political communication. And it seems to be ignored by um, uh, politicians. You, you shouldn't have to wait for the high court at a very costly price to make a decision that our politicians should know better. So definitely, even though the, the Human Rights Commission is a, a statutory body separate, like it doesn't have the ability to make laws, there's a lot that the president can do to uh, not be, uh, well, for example, what happened to the, the QUT students. I mean, that was Triggs who, who let that get out of hand. So there is uh, things that the president can do to basically limit the, the harm that uh, the, the Human Rights Commission can do if it is to exist. Absolutely. I think what we need to expect is that a president of the Human Rights Commission is not going to further aggravate the erosion of fundamental rights in this country. Certainly, it was an undermining of the rights uh, of those students. Think about, for instance, like what happened with them. I think it's um, a very terrible thing when you have the process being the punishment. I think, look, in many ways, even if you're found to be innocent at the end of the story, uh, how can you recover from the trauma and even to be called a racist for a statement that was actually against racism in that, in that particular environment? And so there is a cruelty to people who might be even suffering from uh, delusion that they are victims of racism. I think many people might actually accuse people and, and seek a lawyer when they should actually seek a psychologist. Because, you know, in many ways what these people need is uh, psychological assistance rather than having a lawyer. Uh, probably a shock, basically yeah. using this poor person as an instrument, uh, you know, just to be use, using the person to see if she can um, offer financial benefits as a result. Of course, like, there are many lawyers who seem to be forgotten the purpose of the law. That is that we should have courts of justice and not courts of injustice. As a, as a legal theorist, I always tell my students that the purpose of the law is to generate justice and provide for the common good, protecting the rights to life, liberty and property. And it seems to be so uh, forgotten these days. I mean, most of the lawyers just think about the pockets, and that's the main problem. That's the problem with this legal nihilism and narcissism that we fi find in these days. I mean, people seem to be really not concerned about real human rights and protection of the individual. Uh, that's an important point that you know, if if somebody feels that you know they're oppressed, they've got the whole power of the law to ba basically you know push you know what what they think in their their mind is happening to them, and basically you know uh, not just ruin the the people who they're making the complaint against, but have a broader impact on the the whole community. Mm -hmm. Well, and another thing is the total inversion of the honors of the proof in some uh, cases. I mean, so that that assumption that you are you are guilty until your innocence can be proven, and that's another undermining of the rule of law. And certainly, like one of the things we had in in the common law tradition is the idea of objective reason and and practical reason, and this whole idea that you know we actually know the law. It's impossible for you and me to be law-abiding if the law is so highly abstract and subjective. 
So this problem is that the problem that we face is that some laws are constructed in, in su such a way as to make it impossible a normal compliance with the with the rules. Because uh, if I depend on what other persons think, uh, or other person is thinking, if I if I have to de rely on the tolerance of the other person that, that is uh, engaged in a discussion with me, I'm completely unprotected. And even if I want to obey the law, I might actually fail because the law might be subject to different interpretations. I mean, so I think this is that pause more than reality where we live, that uh, everybody can do whatever they think, interpret things the way they wish. And most of these laws are not based on a tradition of natural law, law of reason, or objectivity, but it's basically about tastes and feelings of people that can vary from person to person. Now you've talked a bit about uh, Rosalind Croucher that she's basically a safe pair of hands who can get along with uh, both Labour uh, and the Liberal Party. Uh, in your opinion, will she have the the will or the courage to significantly change the operation of the the Commission? Um, that is a good question. I, I I have the impression that you know she's going to be uh, aware of what the government of the day uh, wishes her to um, how to conduct himself if I can put it like that but certainly if we get a labor government I think uh, in many ways the problems can be brought back to the equation and certainly like um, the point with this kind of appointment is that Labor loves disappointment. I mean, one thing that's amazing is that when you get Bill Short and in, in the position praising what you you do, it it's like a very strange thing to me. I think we should have actually a, 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 an opposition uh, somehow thinking, well, this was not exactly what I want. But then we had the opposition uh, celebrating that particular appointment and saying how wonderful it was. I have something to tell you. When Bill Shorten agrees with something, I'll probably have inevitably to be very worried to agree with. So there is something wrong when you get everybody from the other side, some of the most radical people actually think you have done the right thing. When they start telling me that I'm doing a right thing, then it's time for me to think different because uh, that's how I measure things. When you get someone who is really unreasonable, and really radical on the other side, telling me how wonderful I am, then I can start to get really worried about. Yeah, uh, the problem with uh, the current government is they, they only want to hear uh, the, the left saying nice things about them. They yeah. they're not, they don't really want to get uh, down in the trenches. Though it didn't um, uh, fill me with confidence that um, Rosalind Croucher's, I think it was second or third day as president of the commission, they released that um, report on, you know, on sexual assault and harassment at uh, university campuses, which was... Uh, I, I looked through the report and so did a lot of a lot of people, and it was easy to see the the flaws in the report. Yet this was yeah. under her presidency, you know, reported by mainstream media as gospel truth. Yeah, well, I tell everyone here to be very careful. For instance, like if I have to see a lady in my office, I have to leave the door open. Another thing, I would never take a lift with a, with a lady with me because it's very very dangerous. Um, now, these sort of things have gone out of control, so it's, um, anything can be used against you and you can be easily, you know, l labeled for something you haven't done, accused of something you haven't done. So I, to I tell everyone to be very careful and that's, that's the reality of things. I mean, even what you're saying class can be used against you. We have no such thing as academic freedom anymore. Uh, for instance, like a student of mine make a comment and he got into trouble. I'm not going to go enter in details because I can't, but uh, if you discuss a, a subject in class, one of your uh, colleagues can actually go to the administration and say that you said something that was not what he or she wanted to hear. So we, it's amazing, you know, it's an amazing thing 
that uh, the left has completely forgotten anything about uh, about protecting freedom of, of speech. It seems almost like if it's the final stage of the long march through the institutions. Because, of course, it, it looks like they were in favor of freedom only when they were still taking over, in the process of taking over. Now they are mainstream. I hate to be called a conservative, to be, fl- to be frank with you. I think I'm very countercultural these days. I, the students like it, by the way. I hate to be called a conservative by any student. I always say conservatives are the lefties. So, you know, they are the new cons- conservatives. They are those who are actually the establishment. We are no longer the establishment. I'm only one here. I have, I'm the last of the Mohicans. So I, I, it's it's good because the students tell me, well, you are very uh, countercultural. You know, you say things that nobody's saying. Instead of, uh, that that's what I do. I'm a, uh, I'm doing a, a classical liberal revolution over here, and I think it's important. That's what you have to do to be bold and courageous, and, and to tell the truth because uh, it's not so common these days. The truth is not so usual to be you know uh, to be to be discussed. We don't have this kind of discussions. Uh, it, it can count against you. And if you if are trapped into this, it can cost you everything. It can cost you your job, your career, your bank account, your family. They go after you. They probably cannot kill you yet, but the rest, they can take away everything you have. Well, there's the saying now, of, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, conservatism is the new punk, which from what you're saying yeah. of... Uh, being an academic at a university seems to pr- probably fit your persona quite well. <laughs> well, I am what these guys were in the 60s. You know, the left used to be like me, talking about being cutting edge and saying something that would be different and protecting what they believed or fighting for a cause. But they now they want just to be mainstream and status quo and you know, uh, they don't like people. They want judges doing things for them. For instance, they are not against, they're, they're, they're in favor of, of, of judicial activism because they don't like people making decisions. Think about Brexit. Think about what the Supreme Court of the United States does. And so they don't need to get the support of the people. People are not, people are racist according to them. That's how they call them. People are stupid. These are a bunch of elitists, you know, and they think they're social engineers and they think they know better than, 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 than the average uh, human being. So they actually request the presence of philosopher kings. And the philosopher kings are the judges these days, you know, they are going, if they cannot convince the people or perhaps even politicians themselves, they, they just go to the courts and get a judge to do the job. That's why perhaps the introduction of a Bill of Rights could be potentially dangerous here because the judge could play with the words that will be found in the document that will necessarily be very abstract in order to further advance their agenda, as it's happening in America, for instance. Oh, we hope uh, eventually, if our side will will see some progress, or you know, in Australia at least, it's I always think that we're one of the, the worst countries when it comes to freedom. It's it's hard to believe that that freedom has become so edgy and rebellious now. But um, that's all I've got time for today. So thank you, Dr. Zimmerman, for uh, coming on. I really enjoyed our discussion, and you certainly shed a light on a lot of the important issues which don't get much coverage. Well, thank you very much. It was such a great pleasure. And keep in touch. Oh, yes, uh, definitely will. And of co- uh, good luck in uh, the university setting in the future. All right. Pray for me then. <laughs> <laughs> thank All you right. very much. All right, everybody, that's the show. So please, if you haven't already signed up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe, please consider working, uh, supporting the work of The Unshackled. You can become a patron on Patreon. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And, of course, don't forget to keep checking theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.